Hey everybody, this is John Bruni and we have an amazing guest with us today. R.J. Molinaire is a Native American alligator hunter, as well as a four-time world champion arm wrestler, 11-time national champion arm wrestling champ, two-time Arnold Classic arm wrestling champion, and two-time GNC champion. He hunts with his son, Jay Paul, on his tribe's sacred land in Homa, Louisiana. He has starred in History Channel's docuseries, Swamp People. Welcome to the show, uh, R.J. Molinaire. Hey, I'm glad to, that uh, I had the chance to uh, be here with y'all today, and uh, I'm looking forward to answering a few questions. Awesome. Now, I didn't miss any extra arm wrestling titles, right? Uh, no, just uh, maybe a national title. You, did you say national? Yes. Yep. That's fine. That's fine. But you did good. <laughs> I want to make sure we get them all. I mean, you're, you're such a legend in that area. And can you tell us, how did you get started in arm wrestling in the first place? Uh, I'm going to kind of cut it short because I could go on for hours. You know, <laughs> you know I'm long ago. When I was a, a teenager from 13 years old to 15 years old, well, you know, a couple of guys uh, always wanted to put their arms up and everything else. And uh, I had a good arm at a young age, you know, uh, arm wrestling arm, and all them older guys would see that, and it, uh, it was always the top of the, the hood of the truck, you know? And uh, and I would beat guys older than me and bigger than me and all that good stuff. And it started off then, and then uh, when I got the age to the age of 17, my uncle said, man, would you like to go into a competition right here in New Orleans? I'm like, uh, you know, it was like scary. It's like, you don't know what you up against, you know? And uh, so I said, I'd love to. And, and so I think in 1976, that's when I started on wrestling. And my first tournament I went to, I got first place. Wow. So from then on, from then on, it just escalated and, and on and on. And uh, it's just in your blood. It's in my blood. And uh, it runs thick through the whole family. That's awesome. And what's really amazing is is the comeback story. You had a car accident that almost ended your arm wrestling career. How did you come back from, you know, such devastating injury? I mean, it really is amazing to see that comeback. It was uh I tell you what, it was um it was almost like we had gave up. And thank God I have a son I have J Paul. He said, Dad, I had won the Arnolds already once. And I want to say this is in 2008. Uh, He said, Dad, do me a favor. I said, what's that, brother? He said, I want you to win the Arnolds one more time for me. I said, well, you know, I'm kind of down and out with all the stuff that I had. You know, I I have a cage in my neck and stuff like that. Um, So he says, I said, well, you know, he said, well, I tell you what, Dad. He said, what, what, what if I do this? What if I help you to get you where you need to go to, to, to win the Arnold? Would you do it? I said, let's get it. And I tell you what, I got to give it to him. He busted my tail. But I tell you what, when I got on that table, it was, he said, that the guy felt good until the referee said go. <laughs> and it was all over with. You know, you blink your eye, you would have missed it. Yeah. So, uh that 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 was uh that was the last time that I won the Arnold. I won it twice, like you said, and uh, so my son Jay Paul got me back on the table. Thank God for that. But that's how it goes. Yeah, it's amazing. And who would you share? Was a couple of things here. Who would you think is your toughest opponent that you faced on the table? And what was your favorite match over your career? Well, you got this guy from. Uh, Turkey, his name is Ingen, and uh, he's he's known worldwide. This guy is like, oh my! I had never felt so much hand strength, and I probably could have beat Amanda, and but when I didn't, re- I was just so uh, guess like uh, the power in his hand kind of threw me off, and it threw me off my game because I was undefeated. I had just beat a six-time world champion. And he comes running up to me and he says, RJ, do you know who you just beat? I said, it doesn't matter. 
He said, what you mean it doesn't matter? I said, I'm here to win just like he's here to win. That guy that you just put down puts me down, and he's also a six-time world champion from Russia. And I said, well, guess what? He just got his tail beat. <laughs> so, but uh, I had a few matches after that, and then him and I met up at the table. Now, he was worried, but what he did and what I didn't know when he was grabbing up with my hand, man, he was just squeezing my hand so tight, and I could have pulled out and said, total ref, you know, you know, his hands, I can't, comp I can't uh, match uh, his pressure because uh, he's squeezing so hard on my hand, I can't close my hand. I could have said that, but it was just, Ingen is so much, he's known, and he's won so many world titles and stuff like that. So I guess just arm wrestling with him, just, I was like stuck on stupid, I guess. And I probably could have put him down, but just his hand strength just threw me off because once he beat me the first time, the second time I said, well, you know what? I'm going to just do what I got to do. And when we went, he went, I, I kind of brought him to about two o'clock and uh, I got out of my position and we slipped. And I noticed that when he, when he got away from the table, he was holding his arm. So if I would have, he had to beat me twice and I only had to beat him one time and I, it would have been over with. But since he was inking, I said, you know, I'm going to have to do everything, pull some, I'm going to have to dig deep in my bag to, to get this guy. And, um, but if I would have hit him like the first time, if I would have hit him the first time, like I did the second time, I would have, I would have probably took it away from him. But uh, that was my toughest uh, opponent. And I have a lot of respect for Ingen. And uh, I just got wind of him the other day. It's been a long time since I've heard from him. Well, with the show, you know, with Swamp People, we was always in some state or uh, going here and there, you know. But a really good guy, but I tell you what, he's very strong. So that was probably uh, my best match and one of my strongest matches that I could remember. Now, did you guys have to strap up then after the Oh, slip? yeah. Oh, yeah. We had to strap up. And uh, you didn't want to strap up with that cat. I mean, at that, he was like, he was the beast of the beast, you know, to beat at 154. And, uh, but his hand strength was so powerful. And I could have, like I said earlier, I could have asked the ref to like to start it. I could have went in the referee's grip and I probably could have beat him like that because he would have just, the minute we were, the referee would have set us up, he would have probably posted up and I would have let him go, you know, because mm -hmm. I couldn't match his pressure. And two like that, that's a foul. You know, you mm -hmm. out, you know, you lose a match. So, but uh, I was just so amazed at his hand strength. Uh, like I said, uh, it, it, my brain went, you know, like into just not thinking enough to take care of business. And uh, but it was good, you know, just pulling that because that was my first time I ever felt that guy's hand. So mm -hmm. you, when you don't know what's coming at you and you never underestimate anyone, it could be the smallest guy out there. He's the one that's going to give you the rough, you know, the, a, a good match. Like they have a little guy named uh, Vaskin. He won the Arnold, I think, already. He's got a small hand, and he's not a big guy. But I tell you what, when you hook up with him, you can swear he's 10 foot tall. And his hand is, you know, big old hand like Cleve Dean. But um, at the Arnold's, I had to beat him. And I'm a top roller. And he was, he was, in, he was a hook. He was a hooker. So... I said, uh, I got to take care of business and I got to do it quick because he's very strong. So when it came to the end, it was him and it was me and Vaskin. And sure enough, I was so uh, like Jay had got me all ready for the game. And when I got up there, I was like, I know what he's going to do. He's going to go into a hook. But it happened so fast. When we say go, I accidentally went to a hook and I drug him clean over, surprised myself that I was so, my adrenaline was going so crazy that I didn't realize how much strength I had left. And uh, he was undefeated and I was undefeated. So I had to beat him twice and I beat him in, twice in his game. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Now let me ask you this um, and you don't have to share if you don't want to, if it's a secret, but 
where do you get your incredible back pressure from and how do you build that? Do you have a secret exercise or is it just high repping or is it going out wrestling alligators, you know, with the rope there? What is the secret to your back pressure? Uh, I'm, I, it's no secret, you know, like, like, I'm going to tell you, like, I'm going to tell you, you could tell a technique or you could tell whatever you want to tell people, but it's up to them to get it and to find it. And, you know, my best back pressure was hammer curls. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I was waiting to say, uh, at the arm of the one I pulled at 145 or 143, I, I was doing a 125 pound preacher curl, hammer curl. And that was crazy. I looked like an ant with a potato chip, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to pick it up. And, um, but that's, that's where you get all your back pressure from that I found. And then also you, you, you can get a strap and just keep pulling back real hard and a lot of wrist curls, but I think the hammer curl and, uh, different little techniques and you pull it to your face and that's where i found that's where i got my strength from also you know what i'm saying and doing that the hammer curl on the preacher that's incredible i don't know a lot of people that you know a lot of times that, that you're talking about curling some people's body weight with one hand and the hammer curl on a preacher bench so incredible exactly. incredible exactly. Yeah, yeah, especially at one at, at one forty three, you're doing a, a hammer curl at one twenty five. A hammer curl with one hundred twenty five pounds. But I was just, uh, I guess, it's good genes. That's awesome. I love that. Well, let's transition for a minute into uh, hunting alligators. Um, this is just fascinating to watch, and I think people might be a little surprised to find out who taught you how to hunt alligators. <laughs> and how did you get involved in it as a profession? Um, it's like where I'm from on the bayou, season to season, they always had some kind of, it was either shrimp season, it was, uh, I, I, I don't know if you ever heard of a neutral rat, uh, and then they had the, um, different different ways of, the, of making a living on, on uh, where we at. And here it comes. The one that showed me how to fish an alligator was my mom because uh, my stepdad had never did it. And while she was teaching him, I was listening and learning. So I was taught by the best, my mom. And, and I tell you what, she taught me how to live off the land. She taught me how to survive and I tell you what, I could keep going on and on and on the way we uh, that she taught me what I needed to do to stay afloat. So uh, I got to give it to my mom. I think that's an incredible story. And then after that, did she get you involved in doing it as a profession, or how did how did that come about? Making the transition from just hunting it, hunting alligators, to being a profession. Uh, you know, um, I totally forgot about that question. Uh, okay. But it, it, uh, at, it started in 1979, alligator season, because they had closed it in the late 40s. Because you, right now, you can't, you cannot hunt them at night. You have to hang a line and uh, bait it. And uh, now, if you see one swimming by during the daylight hours, you can shoot them. But at night, you cannot. You, you can go out and scout, but you can't shoot them. But it just runs in, uh, in our family that uh, you, um, whenever alligator season comes around, it's in your blood automatically, you know, after I pulled away from, after my mom showed me all the techniques, I said, well, mom, look, uh, I'm going to go on my own, you know, I'm going to let y'all take care of business on this and it looks like y'all got it under control. And then once you take off, once I, once I got my own equipment, um, Jay Paul was probably three years old, and my wife is crazy. My wife said, um, she was in college, she said, uh, RJ, I'm, I'm about to do clinicals. She said, alligator season's getting ready to start. I'm going to have to get a sitter. I said, well, stay still. I said, uh, you don't have to worry about that. I have a sitter. She said, who? who? I said, my boat. I said, <laughs> I got a seat. 
and I have a life vest. And that's my sitter right there. And she said, at three, I said, look, that's the only way he's going to learn. That's the way I learn. You got to, you, you know, that's how we are down on the body. We, uh, we get taught young how to survive. And that's how I got started. I love that. And one of the interesting things that's, I think, unique about you and Jay Paul is that you use an airboat uh, versus a traditional boat. What advantages do you think that being having an airboat provides? You know, we have, uh, uh, they don't really show that boat one. We have the airboat that we go in. You see with the other guy, Troy, he fishes the swamp, okay? Mm-hmm. Where I fish, I fish the marsh. It's just like a land that, that just a floating marsh. And, uh, and then we have what we call our ice boat. So we could go into the marsh and go find them duck ponds where the alligators hang out, where there's no traffic, where other people can't go because they're in our board. So that was our advantage on them. And so what we would do, we would stay in the marsh until we had about 20, 25 gators in the airboat, and then we'd go find our ice boat, and we'd unload, and then we'd head back to the marshes. So that's, that was the, I think, you know, that gave us the better advantage on the other guys with our boards, you know. So uh, we could travel the marshes here compared to the swamps, you know. Uh, don't get me wrong. You can go in the swamp with an airboat, but not like around here. It's just like uh, what we call a float, and the airboat just goes all over that like no problem, you know. And uh, so that's why we love the airboat. It does the job. Fantastic. Um, for people that don't know, because this is an interesting thing too, what is the usual bait that you guys use for alligator hunting? Now, you don't have to share the secret sauce or anything like that, but what is it that alligators love the most? You know, probably I'm going to even go up to 97% of the alligator fishermen over here in Southeast Louisiana speak about. They use chicken. Jay and I, we don't use chicken. We use the neutral rat because they have a bounty on the neutral rat because they, it's just like termites. They're eating all the, the marshes and everything else, so they have a bounty on it. Uh, instead of wasting the meat of a neutral rat, that's the alligator's favorite food because he's out, it's out there with him. So what we do, they have a bounty on it. They give you like $6 for the tail, and then what we, what we do, we cut the legs off and we, we cut the parts we need off of it. Well, you, nothing goes to waste. It all comes, you know, but we cut it up. But you could put a chicken and a neutral rat, a, the leg of a neutral rat, it's going to be the five to one. And so that's our technique with also. And then also people put lines about three to four feet off the water thinking they're going to get a big alligator. It don't work like that. A big, smart alligator wants to come up to his bait, I mean, come up to the whatever sitting out there that he thinks is going to take off, he's going to hide. He don't want to be seen. And then once he grabs it, he don't want to make any noise because he's going to attract other, you know, alligators in that area. So I put my line, my bait, two inches from the water. And that's how I caught my biggest alligator. I had put my bait two inches above the water and, uh, you know, that's when the big ones start coming in. And everybody else, another thing that they do, is they use a 22. Uh, once the show has started about the third or fourth year, J. Paul mentioned to me the 17 HMO. And he said 17. And he said, no, that. He, he said, uh, he said uh, it's not stronger. It's a little bit more kick. Then a, um, a 22 Magnum, but it's not smaller than a 20, you know. So it, what it does, cut a long story short, when a 22 Magnum is going to go an inch deep, uh, the 17 will go an inch and a half, and it takes the brain stem out so that so the alligator does not suffer at all, the way we shoot them. Like they call it the quarter, the quarter size sh- shot you got to you got to take. Well, with that 17, it penetrates it all the way down, and that once you get that one shot in them, you don't have to shoot them anymore. You throw them in the boat. I don't take the mouth because I know my man, 
Jay Paul took care of business. Yeah, that's one of the things, you know, I always, when I'm watching the show in the past and just seeing different videos, you guys don't tape because you don't worry about that thing ever coming back to life. You know, it's very interesting. You guys, yes. You guys... And, you know, I have I have confidence in my son. Well, you know, when we, when we were doing it before the show started, well, we wouldn't even talk to each other, really. We just use sign language. And just by Jay looking at me and just the reaction that we'd make he knew when to shoot when not to shoot when we had to leave and all that good stuff so we would mostly use body language and our hand signals you know and so the producer told us one day say guys i gotta talk to y'all we was like what you know we were saying what's going on he says y'all need to start talking a little more because the audience don't know what y'all doing so that's when uh, we had to explain everything that we was doing, how why we was doing it like that. But when you're doing alligator fishing, like you're not realizing you're not you're not talking because you know your part, you know, and uh, sign language and body language and body movement. So um, that was pretty interesting when they told us that because we didn't even realize we was doing that. So it's pretty cool. Now, can you tell us a little bit about gator hunting tags because a lot of people don't know. How, how hard is it to get a tag? How important is it to fill all those tags? Can you kind of share with the audience what the process is um, it, with getting them and why it's important to fill them? Uh, you have to have just like, um, let me give it them a better idea. I'm sure you understand this better. It's just like when you have a hunting lease, they will give you so many doe tags. You got to take so many doe tags. I mean, you got to take so many does out. Over here, you have to have so much wetland you get one tag per hundred acres makes no sense because they got a lot more than gators than that they should at least go to two or three uh tags per acre but it's still one tag so it depends how many acres you have and how many leases you have that's how many tags you're going to get so you know uh jay and i did um this guy had all kind of land and he had like uh, 500 tags. Well, he really had 600, but uh, he, he said, hey, man, y'all want to uh, fish them, uh, see if y'all get... Well, Jay Paul asked me, he said, Dad, he said, uh, they got it offered you them 500 tags. He said, why you didn't take them? I said, I didn't think you wanted them. He said, yeah, I'd love to fill 500 tags in 30 days. <laughs> I said, you don't know what you... I, I told myself, I said, he don't know what he's wishing for. I tell you what, after we did that and we, we filled... 500 tags in 30 days. I tell you what, I was happy to see that last one come in the boat. You know what I'm saying? Because that sun, they don't really, they don't really, if, like Jay says, he wish you have a, what you call that, a scratch and sniff. And if they could feel the heat, the humidity, and the smell, it's crazy because the bait, to get a good alligator, the bait needs to be a little ripe, you know? So, um, yeah, so uh, that's what the, but we did it, you know, we did that 500 tags and I tell you what, he didn't ask again to do 500, <laughs> you know, but you know, I don't say that he didn't want to do it uh, because of that. I'm, I'm just going to say when the prices went down, the, the prices lowered, it didn't, we didn't want to fill more tags. We wanted to let the price come back up. So uh, what we did, we would, uh, we'd fish between 250 to 300 tags and that was plenty enough because, uh, about that time, the, the season, you know, the 30 days was about a lot, you know. So uh, you didn't have to rush, 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 and, you know, and do what you, you could take your time and almost uh, you, you had an idea what a gator was at that you was looking for. So it, it worked out just right. I hope that you're enjoying this podcast, and we'll get back to our guest in just a moment. But I want to share a quick word about our sponsors. The Pressing of Limits podcast is brought to you by zionmissionarychurch.net, where you can listen and watch messages, you can share prayer requests, or you can even find out how to plan a visit. And also by neuropowersource.com. These are resources for your mind, your body, and your spirit. You're going to find all the recommended supplements and gear that I use, including the Be Strong Bands, the new Juve 3.0 system, clear light infrared saunas, and so much more. You're going to be one sure to check it out. Um, do you have any great 
hunting stories and maybe any close calls that you've ever had? I mean, I watched one where you guys jumped in the water, which I thought was amazing. But do you have mm-hmm. any favorite stories or close calls? Well, you know, let's 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 just go with the one that you know, uh, our rule is: I don't care if it's duck, deer, rabbit. I don't care. You draw first blood. Whoever pulled that trigger needs to find whatever they shot because that's the way we live off the land. That's our food. That's the way of life. So we're not just going to shoot it and say, well, we can't find it. We've seen some blood, but we're going to go to the next line. That's not how we work. So Jay Paul, we were, we were uh, doing our lines, and all of a sudden he said, Dad, don't move. He said, they got a giant right next to us. He said, I want to bust them with a 17. He's good. Jay Paul should have been a sniper, you know. And yeah, so I didn't move, but he wasn't looking down when he picked up the bullets. What he did, instead of picking up a, a, the, the kind that penetrates, he picked up a hollow point. And a hollow point, the minute it, hit, it hits, it splits. You know, it just goes all over. And what happened, he hit it, and it skimmed over the top of the head. The worst thing he could have did, because uh, an alligator that, that's surviving because he's, like, got knocked silly, that's more of a thing. It, it was like fighting with a grizzly. So uh, they cut it a little short. But it lasted 45 minutes. Well, anyway, let me, I'm, I'm going in front of us. I'm going too far in front. Of, so anyway, the gate is cutting flips. I had left my throw hook in my airboat because we was in the white in the flat boat. And uh, I didn't have my hook on me. So I tried to make a hook to try to hook him in the water. But every time I grabbed a hold of him, he would just roll. And so I told you, Paul, I said, there goes $500, bro. I said, if you want me to go get it, I'll go get it. I said, but you know the rules. He said, Daddy, I know. So he took off his gear, jumped in the water, and uh, he was an MMA fighter at that time, and he's a, also a, a, a boxer. And I'm like, Jay, he's over here. He's over there. And Jay said, Daddy, I got him. He just passed between my legs, and that's all I heard. And he went under the water. He grabbed him. He comes up with a, a, what you call that, a real chokehold. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm like, oh, my God, you know, this kid is going to eat him alive. You know, he's going to hurt him. So uh, I could not show, I could not let the gator feel fear, and I couldn't let Jay feel fear. So I had to be strong head. I, you know, I had to keep my mind right and keep focused and keep Jay focused because the minute Jay, I lost my focusness on Jay Paul, that gator would have tore him apart. And Jay Paul had a little little t-shirt on with, you know, like a uh, undershirt. And when he got into the boat, uh, he said, dad, he says, uh, take my shirt. He said, here my shirt. He said, the alligator's trying to put his back paw, his back leg in my shirt. And what would have happened, he would have wrapped himself up in Jay's shirt and just started going into a debt roll and just keep beating him against the boat, you know, just like spinning him against the boat. So that's a good thing. He taught that fast. So he threw his shirt off and, um, I said, I said, Jay, I said, let me grab a hold of the alligator and you can jump in the boat. He said, Daddy, I don't have the alligator. The alligator has the boat. So the, it, the alligator had grabbed the bottom of the boat. So you know what side of the alligator that was. I said, well, I tell you what, I'm going to grab his front leg. And when I say go, I need you to jump in the boat. I tell you what, when I say go, it sounded like, just like a bear, you know how they, 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 they'll, they'll uh, snap, you know, like uh, to, to tell you to stay away. Well, that's what he was doing. He was coming at Jay. I mean, he, he, he felt that he was going to catch Jay. I tell you what, I've never seen Jay move so fast. He got in the boat, grabbed the rifle at the same time, swung it down, and busted him. And we got him. He was 12 feet, 4 inches. Oh, my goodness. And, yeah, so it was. Uh, I tell you what, you know, I only have one boy that I know of. <laughs> you know, uh, but anyway, you know, I was, you know, I, I was, I was, I can't say I wasn't worried or scared, but I couldn't show no fear because, uh, well, after he did all that, he 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 earned his stripes. I said, you know what, he can go on his own now because uh, if you're gonna jump in the water and fight an alligator twelve foot four inches, well, I tell you what. You you a bad boy. Yeah, you're, you're you're a warrior in my book. 
you know, so uh, it was pretty cool. But after we got to get it in, we both fell back and said, we were tired. It was crazy. Stressed, tired, and tired from wrestling this deal, you know. So it was pretty fun. Yeah, I like how you end it. It's pretty fun. For most people, say it's pretty terrifying. (laughs) But, you know, to me, and, and also, a lot of people don't understand me because, they look at me and they say, RJ don't smile, RJ don't, you know, it look like he's, he's arrogant and stuff like that. No, I'm focused because I respect the alligator. And when I'm doing, I'm, I'm fishing alligators, I stay focused. I don't go with an alligator. I do what I have to do, take care of business and put them in a the boat. I don't play around with gators because that gator could take your life quick, you know? So, uh, that's why I just look serious and there's nothing to do with being arrogant or anything like that. It's just, that's just the way I am. You know, you know, I take care, I take alligator hunting real serious because I'm not scared of alligators, but tell you what, the first chance that they'll get and bite and get a hold of you, that could be the India, that, that could be the India line right there, you know? So, uh, yeah, I have a lot of, re- a lot of respect for alligators. So that was a monster gator. It, was that the biggest gator you've ever caught, or what, what's the biggest monster you've ever caught? The biggest one I ever caught was 13 feet, 8 inches. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and uh, I tell you what, that was not only he was long, he was big, and he, he was just a big, big gator. And uh, he was, again, here's the airboat. We caught him with an airboat way deep in the uh, marsh and come to find out i guess when he was younger or he got into a bad fight with another alligator he was blind Mm. and every time i'd come to a line right there the alligator was just pulled in all kind of pieces especially if it was a little male he would hear noise and he would what he would do he would go around and hear noise and whatever was on the line he would kill it and uh, smash it all up and it was no more good so what i did uh, i fooled him i put seven lines out in one circle because and i put different types of bait on it and believe it or not out of seven lines i caught six gators and the last one was him and so uh, yeah so it was pretty cool and uh, he was, uh, like I said, he was 13-8. That was a, a bruiser. But uh, I'm glad I took him out of there because it was where a lot of people duck hunt. If they would have pulled their pirogue or their dug out into some grass, and that boy, that big boy right there would have been would have been in that area, he could have killed the. Uh, I mean, he would have tore that pirogue up, and uh, he would have just took them out because, like I said, I don't think he could see, but he would do everything by sound. So uh, it was it was a, a a very interesting gator. Yeah, well, that's a that gator's bigger than that little piro. <laughs> that's for sure. Exactly, exactly. And uh, we've had some that we caught that had you know people are jug lining. You know, uh, they they put you know cat, they fish catfish with jugs or two leaders. And you, uh, Jay in the summertime had seen a jug and it had something on it and. Uh, he told his little boy to go pick up and see what kind of catfish they had on it. When Jip, when his little boy picked it up, it had about a 12 foot alligator on it. <laughs> so oh his goodness. little boy was like, dad, that's not no catfish. That's a big old alligator. But anyway, we ended up catching them. The one with the jug in his mouth. And, uh, he, he was, uh, pushing 11 feet. Yeah. So it was, a uh, it was a good one, but it's the way his son said that he said, dad, man, he got a big old alligator. He threw that thing so fast in the water. It wasn't fun. I mean, it was crazy, but that, that was the, uh, you get some, you get some fun times out there. You get some close calls. I got caught by the pants right away, but I get it. And I also got bit when we, when, when we fish in the airboat, we wear steel toe boots because your foot is right on the edge of the boat. And I knew one day that an alligator would actually grab my foot. And sure enough, I was wearing caterpillar boots. And I got bit twice, <clears throat> excuse me, I got bit twice in one day by a 10 and a half foot, uh, a 10 and a half and a nine, you know, for that, uh, that big of an alligator to, gra- to, to grab your boot. 
I thank the good Lord that I had steel toes on, on because once he grabbed it, I could feel the pressure all the way into my hip. And if I would have got scared and picked my leg up, what he would have did, he would have went into the debt roll. He would have probably twisted my leg off at the hip. So I didn't panic. I just stood there. And then Jay Paul came to the back for the captain. And uh, I, I was I was, I was, was blessed by that because uh, I felt like I would have been by myself. I would have been there for a while. You know what I'm saying? But he pulled the top, the, he pulled the top clean, the leather clean off that steel. And you can see his teeth mark. Sweat that steel, but it, it was a a funny feeling. I bet that's amazing. The bite force, I can't imagine uh, having oh, that man. on your leg. What was it like? What was your experience like being on the show Swamp People? What's it like to have knowing that you're being filmed where you're going through this process of hunting? Is that did that change things up a lot for you? Well, I actually told the uh, I actually had told a producer like three times that I wasn't interested, you know, because I didn't want to have nobody else in my boat. I didn't want nobody else to know my techniques. I didn't want nobody else to know this and that, like you like he had said earlier. But now it doesn't bother me because, you know, I, I want to spread the uh, the ways that we fish. That way the younger guy, the youngest, the younger boy and girl that's coming up can learn, you know. So um, uh, it's a... Uh, it was it's something uh with the question where we'll go <laughs> well just what was that experience like having you know have being filmed all the time you know having okay. somebody on you you know when you're yeah i to told I, I had told them that um uh, that i didn't want a cameraman in my boat i said because he's going to be in my way he said well i'll tell you what rj the producer told me he said i'll tell you what if any one of them cameramen get away or they i don't care what it is you call me i'll send you another cameraman so our, our cameraman that we had for the first season that we did, you couldn't find a better one. I mean, he was like a squirrel. I mean, you never knew where he was at. He was, he was, he was underneath you. He was on top of you because we had a spot for him to go up. Or he was on the seat. He was a very good cameraman. And we had some great cameramen. But, uh, you know, they didn't, get no, they didn't get in the way thinking like I was thinking, you know, because uh, uh, I wasn't too crazy about having somebody else coming with me. But... It's something that we didn't even pay no mind to them no more after a while. But uh, but at first, I thought it would have been a pain in the butt, you know, to have somebody with us in the boat. That's a more weight. That's more weight in my boat. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. But it worked out good. It worked out really good. And and how special was it uh, not just to do the show, but to be able to hunt every season with your son? What? How special is that bond that you two have? You know. My son, people don't understand the way my son and I talk to each other. My son, he's my son, okay, but he's also a friend. Mm. So he's been doing it since he's three years old with me, and uh, we made this bond that sometimes I forget. I, sometimes I think that he forgets that I'm his, I'm his dad, you know, and, 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 and the same thing with me, you know, and we just, we just, but... <clears throat> Take it back. Also, I would I would not have did this show without Jay Paul because he was the, the guy. He was my partner from the beginning, and I was hoping that we could finish it off with with, with my son. You know, so uh, it's uh, you know, he's he's the guy that was with me every time. Everywhere I moved, he was with me. So uh, it was a, it was a really it's really a good time fishing with your son or your daughter or your wife. You know. Before we had any kids, my wife would do it. But before we had anything, I would do it alone. And then my wife started doing it with me. And then once we had Jay Paul, uh, he got old enough. We start. I started off with Jay Paul, you know. So uh, then I, and so I just stuck with Jay Paul. It's the only boy I had, and uh, I got to show him a lot of things that my mom showed me. And uh, I tell you what. Jay Paul is a really a good alligator hunter. That's awesome. Now, I know you're a man of great faith, and can you share with us uh, how important your faith is to you? But also, can you educate the listeners and share a little bit about the Homa tribe? I, I think a lot of people don't know uh, the background here. And can you share us a little bit about the tribe, too, and your faith? Yes. Um, 
they started showing, you see, every time they have just say like, uh, um, um, like just say a shrimp seal ready to open. Well, we call it the blessing. The, uh, a lot of boats is going to go in the back of the canal and the priest is going to stay at the, at the uh, where the boats are going to pass. And each boat that passes, the priest is going to bless that boat. Same thing with us with the alligators. Be, before I start cooking alligators, well, I'll, 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 I'll go all around my boat and I'll burn some sage. And I'll go all around and I ask the creator for us to have a great alligator season, no injuries, uh, on and on, you know. So, yes, we do, um, we do it the Native American way, and we also do it with the uh, shrimp boats, get uh, the boats blessed. So, uh, yeah, um, we do do uh, um, stuff the Native American way also, you know. So that, that, that with the sage burning and or we'll have our uh, medicine man come out and do a big blessing um, so we could have a great season. And uh, so, uh, so we do it two different ways, you know. So that's how we start off. Every season we start off, we we try to bless our boat, you know. So that's that's a lot about that. Yeah, can you share? Us. Well, can you share with us a little bit about the Homa tribe? You know where you guys are located. Uh, just a little bit of history about that. I know we have a short show, but just mm-hmm. can you give a little background to that for people that may not be familiar with your tribe? We uh we split off off of four different uh, tribes. Um, I'm um I, there's two of them that I can't pronounce, but uh, we we Choctaw and Homa and uh, Chittimacha and uh, Biloxi also. Yeah. So anyway, um, but once we once we left uh say around um. When we when we was getting pushed down further, further and further further to the south, uh, well, that's when everybody's just started going different angles. So we lucked up, and we got some good stuff. We ended up on the edge of the. We couldn't go no further. It was marsh, so we we started living in the marsh. And uh, come to find out, we had all the food. We we had all the food that we needed. We had all the uh, anything you needed. You had it right there in hand. You know, so. Uh, it, it, you know, some people take it, look at it in a bad way. At the time, it was probably, it wasn't my time, but at that time, it was probably, they was thinking it was a bad thing, but not knowing that we was rich with everything we needed, you know, with food-wise, you know. So, yeah, so the Native, uh, we still do it today. We still um, live off the land, and uh, the same way that people did it years back when they used to live in, uh, we, we didn't live in teepees, we lived in, Palmetto huts, hmm. and uh, so uh, yeah. So I have pictures of my grandmother and my 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 grandfather uh, in them uh, Palmetto hut that they would build, and uh, they made a good living. Yeah, that's amazing, amazing story. I love Cajun food. I live in the Midwest, but I love mm-hmm. Cajun food. What is one of your specialty dishes, or do you have a favorite dish, especially with alligators that you make? We, we, uh, my mom, my wife, my granddaughter, my sister, and my the whole the gang, the whole gang cooks different. But I like an alligator sauce piquant, Ooh. and uh, or you could you could fry your alligator, but I prefer. An alligator sauce pecan. You can't. You can't. I tell you what. You put that on top of rice. It just is. It's something that you're gonna come back for some more. So yeah, you could. You know, like I said, an alligator has different types of meat. Mm-hmm. An alligator's tail is white meat. The uh, alligator's legs is red meat. So that's the part you use to make the alligator sauce pecan with. Mm-hmm. The tail is the part that you fry. You know, but some people do it different, you know, but this, that's what we, that's the way we do it. You know what I'm saying? Because if you don't take the fat out of an alligator, you're not going to eat it. It's going to be chewy. If it's chewy and it's got a weird taste to it, don't eat it. Because an alligator that was prepared right, you're going to love it. I'm going to give you an idea. It tastes like fried fish. 
when they fry it, you know. So the sauce pecan, alligator sauce pecan, I can't tell you what it tastes like, but good, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but that's my, that, you know, I have to say that would be one of my favorite dishes, uh, alligator sauce pecan. Love it. That rice. It's good stuff. You got to have the rice. I love it. Well, just a closing couple questions. Uh, where can people find out more about you? You know, what, what you're up to uh, these days. And is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I mean, if, if they need to get a hold of, because uh, when it gets a little, when, when springtime is going to get closer, I do airboat tours. So um, if they want to come down and do a tour with RJ, RJ, uh, just look up on our web page, RJ and Paul, and um, what? Or look up Kita Entertainment, and it's going to lead you to the page and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. So if they want to come out and go on a private ride with RJ, or if they want to go with uh, I could hold 10 in one boat and I hold four in another boat. If they want to go fast, I take the smaller boat. If they want to just go and relax or if they want to come at two and be private, we, we, we give them what they want. And uh, I don't set a time like other people do. Once I put them in my boat, I make I, I watch them close. And when I see they're having fun, I keep going. But then when I see they're starting to slow down a little bit, then I'll turn around and come back to the dock. I try to make them, I try to keep them happy. And so far, they've been happy, you know. And uh, so, yeah, they, they need to come down. And uh, I had people tell me that, you know, RJ, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate the ride. It was really nice. We didn't realize what kind of... Uh, what kind of person you are and what kind of airboat tour that we was on. So uh, it worked out, it, you know, they enjoy it. And it's right out of a, it's right out of a Homa, about 15 miles east of Homa on the bayou. So they, uh, they come out and get a ride. They're going, they're not, they're not going to regret it. That's awesome. If I'm ever in your area, I'm showing up. I want to do that. I think that'd be a life-changing experience, especially for people that are in the north. It's a it's a totally different world down south. So, right. I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah, you did. You just said you 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 hit the right word right there. It's a different world down here. You know, just like the way we live. A lot of people don't know that that we live off the land, and uh, you know, we don't shoot something just to shoot it. We don't catch something just to catch it. And we got it all. You know, on one side of the intercoastal canal, we have uh, fresh water. On the south side of the intercoastal canal, we have salt water. So, uh, and uh, if you want to go deer hunting, you open your back door and you go deer hunting, you know, <laughs> or your front door and you go deer hunting. So, uh, you know, we blessed. You know, the creator took care of us and put us in a good spot. So, uh, and plenty of food to eat. So that's one thing we're not going to go out of is food. I'm hoping not anyway, you know, but yeah, it's a, um, it's a good place to be, but I need you to come and check us out. And I'll tell you what, bring a friend. I'll be more than happy to go give y'all a tour. And uh, awesome. uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. That's awesome. I want to thank our guest today, RJ Molinaire for investing in all of our listeners. Fantastic show. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Again, I want to thank our sponsors, ZionMissionaryChurch.net, NeuropowerSource.com, podcast producer, Drew Kiespert, video director, JoLynn Thomas, head of talent relations, Mr. Fairfax Hackley. Be sure to rate us and subscribe to the Pressing Limits podcast and follow us on Instagram for the latest episodes. For more ways to watch and listen to this podcast, check out the Pressing Limits podcast website.